So the next person I want to invite up is Rochelle Melville, if you want to make your way up here. I met Rochelle a few years ago, actually. She was doing um, the art, uh, art therapy role at North Pine Christian College, uh, which is a school that I used to go to. And when you first told me what you did, I was just gobsmacked with how incredible that role is. And, and schools need that as well, like being able to... Sorry, I'll hold it down here. Being able to help kids through art, you know, trying to understand what's happening. So we're so blessed to have her. She is an intentional creative art therapist. Um, her husband and her have a bespoke timber fountain pen business. I actually have one and they are beautiful. Um, she's a storyteller, a feminist, a God seeker, a hat wearer. And I love this description. She is a woman with a pathological aversion to conformity. Conformity. Conformity? Yeah, conformity. <laughs> Please welcome Rochelle. Thank you. So because I have a pathological uh, aversion to conformity, I'm not wearing my hat tonight. <laughs> so my brother was the smart one. My sister was the little one, and I got the label of the creative. <laughs> they all kind of rolled their eyes, and I think they all hoped I wouldn't do anything with it as a career, but it turns out I certainly have. So I remember writing skits for my friends at school to perform when I had the lead role every time. I stitched stuff, I drew stuff, I painted stuff. I even had a stint of knitting. I knitted a pink scarf. It started off this big and it got down to there. There was holes all through it, it went in the bin, but it was fun for a while. My mother made sure there was endless candle wax, paint, plaster of Paris. I remember, because I'm that old, we used to shrink chip packets in the oven and they would go from this big to this big, and you could make them into key rings. And anyone else remember this? It's fantastic. I remember carving scary faces into turnips with my best friend for Halloween, and we had to do it in my bedroom in the dark, and we stole the birthday candles out of the birthday box so we could have jack-o'-lanterns. I've always been creative. And one of my favourite memories, because you know when you're a kid, you just have a favourite item of clothing. Well, mine was a T-shirt that I painted. It had a koala bear on it, and I wore it for 12 months, and it was just a wonky-eyed koala bear, looking really awful, but I loved it. And it was made with puff paint. Are you with me? Puff paint! You iron and it puffs up. It was fabulous. <laughs> anyway, so I've always been creative, but then I stopped creating. I just stopped. I didn't do anything except I wrote very dark poetry about all those boys who took my fragile teenage heart and folded it into tiny paper boats and threw them in the dark and stormy seas where they were abandoned and they sprung holes. I still have all that poetry. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> Hugh McLeod says, everyone is born creative. Everyone is given a box of crayons in kindergarten. And when you hit puberty, they take the crayons away and replace them with dry, uninspiring books on algebra and history. Being suddenly hit years later, suddenly hit years later with the creative bug is just a wee voice telling you, I'd like my crayons back, please. And so I found myself, new mum, three little kitties. I wanted to create again. I discovered scrapbooking, and I sewed my kids' rugs and cute little clothes, and I made beaded jewellery that was awful and wouldn't sell at the markets. I began teaching craft classes, though, and I actually made some really good money. And I started making art in a very small journal, and I fell in love with art journaling. And I found out it was called art journaling because I found this great philosopher called Google who told me that what it, what it was. And I found YouTube, and I was hooked. And I actually be, began a YouTube channel about art journaling. And I got a lot of hits. It's still there, but I won't tell you where it, what it's called. <laughs> and then I began teaching this art journaling, and people kept saying, I feel so good when I'm creating. My art journal is my best friend, it's by my bed. I take it out, I'm like, huh? It's just art. And they were telling me that they felt empowered and they would have tears and they processed their life through these artworks. That was so interesting. Again, the philosopher Google told me, go study art therapy and God, and so I did. So I've been, I've been art journaling for nine years, and during that time, it's been like this pregnancy. 
nine long years of God birthing something in me. He showed me so clearly that this is amazing intersection between art and creativity and spirituality. And I've heard that clearly tonight as well. So the art journaling that I practice and facilitate is an intentional practice. It's a spiritual practice that allows one to explore their faith and doubts and provides scaffolding for the hope. It's a safe and nurturing place. It's worship and having difficult conversations with oneself and with God. And sometimes he even replies. Because you know what? Art journaling as worship invites us to explore the narratives within ourselves. And because we were birthed in the imagination of God, it's only fitting we can respond by using our imagination and creativity to connect back to the source. So let's place some parameters around the art journaling. There's a table outside. I've put a whole bunch of art journals that go way back, right? My original art journals are out there. There's some clips in them. Feel free to flip through to the clips. I've just kind of made some that might be easiest for you to see. But please go and um, I want you to um, see what I'm talking about after this if you have a chance and you'd like to. So, it's a spiritual practice. If it's not about the artwork and making an art, because that's art, but this is a spiritual practice, so it's different. So what is art journaling as, as worship? It's a process, not a production. It's not about the end product. It's my process that I apply. So it's often private. It's often you and God and an art journal. It might be a verse, a word, a question, a doubt, a pondering. Often for me, it's a song. I love to journal to music. It's using whatever you have on hand a pencil, a crayon, glue stick. I love to cut up old magazines. I do a lot of collage. If you have to steal your child's texters while they're asleep, do it. It's whatever art supplies you have. So what is it? Scribbling, doodling, making shapes, wonky stick figures. But we all feel a bit wonky now and again, don't we? It's cutting out pictures, it's dropping ink, it's painting with your fingers, it's writing away your heartache. It's putting your tears into your watercolours. It's externalising the chaos within. It can be thoughtful, joyful, playful, gratitude-filled. And a lot of the pages I show out there are exactly that. They're my rejoicing ones. But sometimes it's also chaotic, smudged outpouring on pencil lead, leaving tired, messy fingerprints on a page. And these are the journals that are stuffed into drawers and shelves beside my bed. And they're mine, just mine and God's. So whatever way your art is expressed, God is always present. He's always looking over our shoulder, reassuring us that he hears and sees everything, every layer, the deepest levels. And all the time he's whispering, you are loved. So... I have come to believe with all my heart and soul that the creative life is inherently an act of great courage. And that quote is from Erwin McManus, my artistic creative mentor. Look up his book. Creativity should be the place where we place our truest selves, where we can really be who we are, but often it's not. We hesitate. We compare our art to others. We make up stories about our lack of creativity. Who's ever said that? I'm not creative. <laughs> We've all said it. So let's own it. But that voice isn't God's voice. He created you to create. So it's taken me many, many years to wear the title and the role artist and artisan proudly and deeply. You see, if you create in any capacity, if you have decorated a cupcake, if you have artistically pruned the roses, if you have thrown together a room that everyone just says, this is a really beautiful place, I like what you've done. You know, if you've painted a sign, if you've taken a photo, you are an artist. So let's talk about art journaling again because that's my specialty, because I want to talk about it. 
because it's not about the artistic representation. There's no right or wrong way to art journal. It is an expressive dialogue between you and God. And you know what? I don't like all my art journal pages. They're embarrassing. They're shameful. They really provoke emotion of difficult times. But that's just an indication I've got some work to do and that God hasn't finished with me yet. I'm not going to use that as an excuse not to do anything. You see, maybe you need to do that work too because the world is missing out on your creativity, your own special branding that nobody else can do but you. So again, Erwin McManus challenges me. He says, who is an artist? Anyone with a soul. So I want to tell you a little story. What is a soul? The raw ingredients of a soul are beautifully written out in the book of Genesis, as many of you may know, where the molecules of mud and the breath of Elohim had the first being become a living soul. So earth body plus breath, soul. We are a living soul. And here's the story. The sun had only ever graced the skies twice. Its warmth now shone on the back of love who formed a long, wispy shadow in front of him. He seemed to be his studying his shadow thoughtfully. The corners of his mouth turned up in a smile and his eyes twinkled like he was up to something. And love's shadow fell half across the form of a man lying still on the red earth in the deepest of slumbers. And for the second time that day, love used his shadow as a template. Love traced his finger the shadow outline as it fell half across the sleeping man. He reached into the still form and drew out a rib. But the man was still whole and complete. He did not stir and the wound completely closed over itself. Because love placed the rib a little to the left of the middle of the shadow that he'd already outlined next to the other form. And suddenly, immediately, the shadow began to materialize into a form similar but distinctly different to that of the sleeping man. And now love knelt for a long time, molecules and atoms moving into new places, following his directives in his head. He smoothed the form with his gentle hands and burst on spontaneously into a song. This new form was distinctly feminine. He placed within her great strength and courage, a lively spirit and a darn keen mind. As a result of the touch, Oh, as a final touch, love pushed his finger playfully into the figure's middle, making a little belly button. And he couldn't help but give a little chuckle. He was pleased with his work. And he sat back, sat back and admired his poema, his masterpiece, his two masterpieces. And this one he called good, very good. He'd also declared the man good earlier that day. And love leaned over and took a slow, deep breath in. He leaned forward and exhaled every bit of air from his lungs. And it was long and warm. And as he exhaled, the earthen form inhaled. And it began to change temperature and texture. And it began to grow tiny pores and grew warm. There was eyebrows, eyelashes, hair on the back of the head and on her legs. The breath of life contained the purest love that you could ever imagine. It was planted deep within this, a fierce, unrelenting love. Same as what he gave the man. But her eyes began to dance now within her and her chest moved up and down. Her eyes flickered open finally. And the very first thing she saw was love. And love extended his hand to her, not because she couldn't get up under her own strength, but out of the highest respect for her. But they all did not live happily ever after. For the hero's journey took on a twist. You see, Lucifer dressed in fine snakeskin boots and entered stage left and kissed perfection with a poisonous kiss that took, shook the entire universe. And the darkness brought its minions of self-doubt, inner critic, selfishness, anxiety, narcissism, greed, and my favourite, conformity. These are the enemies. What if these obstacles and sufferings and the out of the comfort zone experiences we find ourselves in are actually a call to adventure? 
It is, after all, the heroine's journey. <laughs> the hero's journey. There's lots of women here, so we never preach to the women. <laughs> what if it's a summons to action? A spiritual quest-seeking warriors who were born for more. What if we are created to create? What if that's it? What if that's the highest purpose we might have in order to bring him glory? And what if our creativity is the greatest thing that will reach the greatest number of people for the kingdom? What if it's the mightiest weapon and the holiest of holy grails? It's made me stop and really think about it. So what if the greatest gift we can give ourselves is surrender? To give in to creativity? To say, I no longer live, nothing in me is mine. Do what you will. Supersize me, God. And what if this daily reconstruction of our identity through Christ allows us to really fulfill our identity as the reason that he came to say, I have come to give you life. What if creativity is such a vital part of it and we're missing it because of those other things? that Lucifer brought in. And you know which ones you wrestle with. You know your Goliaths. You know your monsters. Because we all have them. So what if we allowed Christ access fully to our creativity? And how might he let his glory show through us? Do you feel it too? A call? A nagging? A sensation? A feeling there's more to the spiritual life than meetings in a building once a week. Stand, sit, stand, sit, pray. Listen, stand, sit, stand, stand, sit. Listen, 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 stand, sit. Sit, I can't get that word out very well. You know what I mean? There's more to it. That's not worship. It's one way to worship. What is the way you're wired for worship? Mine is art journaling. What if our greatest calling, our mission, our destiny, and our truest desires are to be both works of art and an artist at work? Did you like that? It's not my line, so I can really boast about that. I'm going to read it again. Erwin McManus. What if our greatest calling, our mission and destiny, our truest desires are to be both works of art and artist at work? You've got to look for the glory and hunt for the grace and seize beauty and ugly and laugh brave and defiant in the dark and you can lose anything but nothing can steal Jesus and he is enough and you have got to live. Anne Voskamp. I think God wanted you to hear something tonight. And I'm done now. I'm just going to read one little closing thing from Erwin McManus again. Because he says it so well, I just can't rewrite it. At first, our soul is like a canvas where others begin to paint the portrait of who we are. And slowly we begin to develop and mature and we take a brush into our own hands and we continue painting our very lives. And then we go beyond that, leaving our mark on the world around us. We don't have to convince children they're creative. All we have to do is let them do what comes naturally. We never have to give permission to a four-year-old. <clears throat> we never have to give permission to a four-year-old to simply draw on the page what they see in their imagination. They don't follow the rules. Yet somehow along the way, this gets restructured. We become convinced that only those who are drawing inside the lines are doing it right and that the rules are more important than anything else, and that we cannot allow our unfiltered imagination to be reflected in reality and in worship, I suggest. So creativity is replaced with conformity. Originality is placed with standardization. We can't let it happen. What if creativity is the great rebellion? How about that? What could we do if we all started being creative right now, to our fullest extent? And the good news is, it's no perfect artists. It's no perfect art. We're all a work in progress and will be until we're dead. Then we're in heaven, so it's different. 
God is not finished with you yet. And if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is we were made for another world. So thank you, C.S. Lewis. And from me, fix your eyes above. Let the master craftsman continue to do the work that he wants to do inside of you. He wants to give you inspiration and the courage to create because you were created to create. Done.